Sir Louis Doyle. Uh, I've written many books about these Sturmgeschütz, but I think it's very important before we ta start looking at the features of this particular one here at Arsenal, if we talk about what was the concept behind the Sturmgeschütz. Um, the, in the period before the Second World War, in 1936-37, the Germans were very concerned about the construction of the big defence lines in France, obviously the Maginot Line with all the fortifications, and the, uh, more particularly uh, the defences on the Czech border, because um, they had ambitions to take back the Sudetenland um, from Czechoslovakia and the Czechs were building these big fortified bunkers along the uh, border and the calculations that had been done of the losses that would be involved in assaulting those uh, border fortifications um, really concerned uh, the authorities. So. They wanted a solution to this and when the political situation got very intense leading up to the 1938 uh, agreement, um, Hitler ordered the, con uh, the construction of uh, weapons that could destroy these bunkers. And coming out of the Spanish Civil War, uh, there was a um, particular action where the Flakabteilung 88 um, had defended the uh, successfully against an attack by uh, Russian T uh, uh, BT-5s and T-26s, and this had been done using the 88 millimeter flak gun, firing over uh, open sites just in the general direction of these vehicles, but the uh, bore sighting down the barrel of the of the flak gun at the oncoming tanks. This had prevented the loss of this action and uh, had impressed everybody in Berlin. So uh, Hitler ordered that uh, some solution be adopted using the 88 millimeter flak gun. So in a rush action uh, over a six week period an 88 millimeter uh, flak gun was taken into the uh, drawing office in Rheinmatal and they developed it into an anti-tank gun. Now what does that mean? Uh, a flak gun um, has uh, one person who looks after the elevation of the gun, one person who looks after the traverse of the gun and another who looks after the range finding and sighting. Um, but with an anti-tank gun, you need all those functions in the one person. So the 88 was modified for that purpose. And this became known as a bunker knacker. And this was towed by a armored eight ton half track. Um, and never actually really got used at that period because the agreement was reached over the Sudetenland and the uh, 80, 88 towed by the flak then became part of the regular uh, anti-tank uh, units and for attacking of bunkers in the invasion of France later on. Meanwhile, uh, one of these uh, uh, bunker knacker 88 millimeter guns was mounted on top of the 12 ton half track and that was used, um, 12 of these were produced and used uh, until 1943. But there was a more permanent solution needed for um, dealing with bunkers and the uh, Waffenamt um, issued a specification for the design of a heavily armoured vehicle that could carry the L24 7.5 centimetre gun close up to a bunker and then it could fire directly at the embrasures and effectively silence the bunker. So that is the origin of these assault guns. Only a small number were originally required. Um, it had 
it used the chassis of a Panzer III, which was the main battle tank uh, planned at that time. But instead of the uh, armor of a Panzer III, which was 30 millimeters at the front, it was using 50 millimeters at the front, which was in theory to allow it go close up to the bunkers in order to attack the embrasures. So that is the origin of an assault gun. Later on, they became used for many, many different things. And obviously when they got upgraded with a long barrel gun, they were very effective in anti-tank uh, defense. So almost by accident, the Germans had a solution to the um, large numbers of tanks uh, they were being uh, having to fight against in Russia um, with the long barrel gun. But this particular uh, version with the L24, that was primarily for bunkers and for infantry emplacements and infantry concentrations, soft skin vehicles and the like. But it was much appreciated by the troops, they liked it and it was very easy to uh, disguise because of the low silhouette. So let's take a look at some of the internal components. Right, here I am at the inside of a Stungerschutz. I'm sitting on a little seat that was put in for the loader. Um, the loader sat here on the right side of the vehicle. The ammunition bays were up here beside the gun. Here you can see the big bridge, bridge that was placed across the chassis uh, onto which the gun was mounted. It's a somewhat... Um, typical artillery arrangement for the gun. It's not something you would see in, in a tank, but uh, it was a very stable platform and uh, gave uh, very, very good service. And this particular bridge arrangement was continued on all the way through the Stungschutz production, even when they put the long 75 gun in here. The, obviously with the long gun, the ammunition was bigger and uh, it was a little bit more uh, cramped in terms of the usage of space. Um, that's about it for this side of the vehicle. Now I'm sitting in the uh, commander seat uh, here on the left side of the vehicle and the commander also in the Stungschutz was responsible for the radio here on his left shoulder. Um, again uh, this was simply in the beginning a receiver set and only some vehicles had a sender in them. But over time, the radios were extended. So by the time the long barrel gun was in place, there was an additional uh, bay on that side of the superstructure to take radio sets so that the loader could take the responsibility for that. And then at that time, the commander got some periscopes above his head in the cupola, and he could also mount his scissors rangefinder scope. Um, this is the bracket onto which the scissor scope was mounted. So the commander uh, had the duties of communicating or taking the orders from higher command and relaying them to the gunner in the gunner's position. So I'll move forward into the gunner's position. This is the gun sight, which is a periscopic gun sight, a typical artillery arrangement, and the, uh, this projected through the roof and allowed the, uh, the sighting of the gun. The traverse is with this, it's still working quite well. And this is the elevation. Uh, okay. Originally, in the early versions, the first two uh, models of the uh, Stungerschutz, this armour plate didn't exist. There was an actual opening here with the gun sight could see through that. But this was improved with the sight that could project out over, gave better protection to the gunner. So I'm moving now to the driver's position. And you can see here, here's his vision sight and uh, an armoured glass block fits in here normally. And then if, he was, if the vehicle was under extreme uh, fire from small arms, he could close down the, vi the uh, visor at the front and use the, these two here is for suspending the so-called KFF2, which is a periscopic uh, 
vision device that operates through, through small penetrations in the armour, giving an improved armour. But the driver has his instrument panel here, his controls for steering here, and uh, the change lever for the gearbox there. So all very well fitted in underneath, using all of the space in the vehicle. Now, a thing that uh, most people don't know and many don't accept is that the hatch in the glassy plate up here is actually an escape hatch. It's not easy to get in and out of that but when you've had uh, a sergeant major shouting at you to do it time and time again you get quite good at getting in and out but it is uh, a way that the driver can escape without having to come back in and uh, compete for exit through the hatch at the rear for the commander or to get over to that side for the gunner to get out. Because obviously this vehicle is also, uh, the space is being used up with ammuni ammunition supplies. So that's where the gunner is, or the uh, driver is. He has a vision slit out here to the side. This was dispensed with because it didn't uh, serve too much of a purpose in later vehicles. But that's it.